All right, guys, I'm going to officially bring this meeting to a close. Thank you so much. Have a fantastic rest of your day. Okay, see you after Christmas. Johnny and Samantha and their precious new baby boy just invited us into a family moment and I'd like to have a quick family moment with everybody who's watching online and those that are here in the room as well. Melanie was so gracious, I'm not going to be quite as gracious when I bring this news to you. We are full, I mean capped, full, no more room. So I'm kind of the innkeeper this year. It's like there's no room. That's the way it's going to be, which means this. If you haven't already registered a seat or made a reservation, you can't come. And if for some reason you're holding on to a block of seats because you're still hoping that maybe your family will be able to gather, we just want to encourage you uh, to be reminded that if you're holding seats, you're actually keeping other people out of the room. So if you could release those for us, that would be great. I also want to remind you of this. Uh, in other years, you could just show up and you could find a seat in the room or in the overflow. This year, you can't do that. And I know some people think, well, they're never going to keep me out of church. Actually, this year, we're going to keep you out of church. Uh, we can't and we won't allow people to just walk in the door without a reservation. So if you do show up and insist on coming in, it's going to be awkward for you and it's going to be awkward for us and that's not going to work. So uh, let's not ruin Christmas and, and play by the rules. We'd be so appreciative of that as well. I want to remind you that there'll be no in-person gathering for services on the weekend of the 26th and the 27th. We've actually pre-recorded those services so that our tech team that's going to be working like crazy on Christmas Eve will actually be able to go home and have Christmas with their uh, family. I do want to remind you, though, we will be having church on the 26th and 27th. We're just going to be completely online. Pastor Wendy Powell has a powerful message. I mean, I could not think of a better way to bring 2020 to a close than the way Pastor Wendy and Jesus decided how to go about doing that. So I want to encourage you. We will be having church. Uh, just if you show up here, the lights will be out. I can tell you the rapture will not have happened. It's just going to be quiet and calm all the way around here. So join us online on the 26th and 27th. The worst Christmas gift that I ever gave my wife was a finch bath. It was a little bird bath for her backyard. And I'll answer the question, why was that the worst Christmas gift in human history? Why will I carry the burden of that horrible Christmas gift to my grave? And why does my family remind me of that horrible gift every single year? It's because of this. You don't give a bird bath to a person who doesn't like birds, okay? It should make sense. You should know better. I mean, if you really love someone, and at the time we'd been married for a really, really long time, you should know them enough for it to register in your brain that if your wife doesn't like birds, you shouldn't be giving her something that actually attracts birds, okay? It was officially the worst gift ever. 2,000 years ago, God gave a gift to humanity. It was actually a way to be reconciled to God. It was a way to overcome sin, sin which we all have in common, separate us from God. And God could have given us what we all deserved because we've all sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. He rightfully could have given us judgment and condemnation. But God's love, which we just celebrated in Advent, kept him from giving us what we deserve. And instead, God gave us a way to be welcomed into his family, a way to overcome sin with his love. And the gift came in the form of a helpless human baby 
His name was Jesus. God sent his son to become like us so that God could save us. So while you've got Grant way over here with the worst Christmas gift ever on the other end of the continuum and the spectrum is Jesus, the best Christmas gift ever. We've been asking a question in the midst of this very different Christmas. What if God has a plan? What if God is actually up to something? What if the God who created that very first Christmas is still working on the same plan 2,000 plus years later? There are two verses in the Bible that I believe encapsulate the heart of God's plan through Christmas. They're familiar and they're so well known. In fact, maybe they're too well known. Maybe we've heard them so many times that they don't even register within our hearts anymore. Maybe they're a little like Silent Night and we needed to find a different way to enter into Silent Night so that the moment could actually mean something. Well, I'm going to read these verses to you slowly and surely. For the veterans in the room who have done this so many times that this is just kind of rote memory. You're kicking in. In fact, some of you are going to hear the verses and you're going to go, really, Grant? That's the best you could do for Christmas What if we just opened our hearts and said, God, could you take something old and make it new for me today? Let me read these words and let me challenge you to simply let them rest on your soul. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son That whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But to save the world through him. As we get ready this week and prepare our hearts for Christmas Eve, I want to remind us in the deepest part of our souls of God's relentless love, of God's relentless pursuit of our hearts at Christmas. These famous verses start with the words, for God. The entire Christmas story begins and ends with God, because while we like to think Christmas is all about us, it's actually all about Him. And I think we need a reminder in the middle of all the crazy, in the middle of the deep divides and the disunity, in the middle of all of the differing opinions that this one anchor truth is still true today. God is God and we are not him. Even if you struggle to believe in God, the reality is still, admitted or not, that God is God. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is omniscient, all-knowing. He's omnipotent, all-powerful, and he's omnipresent all present. God right now is here and in Africa and in Central America and in Iran and in Iraq and Russia and Australia. God is in all of those places simultaneously because God is God. God is holy. God is glorious. God is perfect and God is personal. For God so loved. You know, the heart of the Christmas story is the truth that God is Love, a literal, literal rendering of that phrase from the original language in the Bible actually sounds like this. God loved the world in this way. There's an emphasis on what God did. There's an emphasis on the lengths that God would go to to prove his love to his own children. For God so loved. And I love those words because that's what we reserve. That little word so, we reserve it for the people that are the most precious to us. It's not just I love you. It's I love you so much. I love you so much. For God so loved the world. Now think about that statement for a second. The world that rejected him. The world that that chooses to be their own God given an opportunity. The people, the the world that that pushes God to the side and, and makes him plan B. That world, that world God loves because of the simple fact that God loves people. I tried to think of a great way to explain this. I tried to use pastoral language and all of my seminary stuff to try and come up with an explanation for the fact that God loves people. And I wish I had a better way to explain it, but I don't. I don't understand it. It's just true. God simply loves people, which means God loves you. And you may have a thousand objections. Honestly, they're irrelevant. God loves 
you. For God so loved the world that he gave. God does not take, he gives. God does not hoard, he releases. God does not withhold, instead he extends a gracious, gracious gift to every person at Christmas time. Which leads us to a truth, God is generous. Unbelievably generous. In fact, you'll hear the language that we use around our offering moments here at Christ the King. We never, ever, ever take an offering because we don't think taking lines up with God's character. Instead, we give back to God our tithes and our offerings. It's a subtle change, but I think it's really important because it links us up with the character of God and God is generous. And the greatest act of generosity is that God the Father gave his one and only Son. Some of your translations say his one and only begotten Son. The original word in Greek is monogenes, and it literally means of the exact same stuff. Well, if God the Father and God the Son are made out of the exact same stuff, it means that God the Father is God and Jesus the Son is God. They are one and the same. They have exactly the same essence. I know it's confusing. And this is where it gets a little crazy when we try to explain the Trinity, which, by the way, is inexplicable. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, three in one, one in three. And some people go, I just don't understand how I can get a handle if you can't explain God. I would say this in response. If you can explain God, you don't have God. So today we're challenged to just be okay with the mystery and the humanity. God the Father gave his only Son so that you and I could be reconciled with God and welcomed into his family. Years ago, I, I grew up in a, in a conservative Baptist church in Brandon, Manitoba, and two people dropped into my life. Their names were David and Muriel Boys. So Bo and Murr, if you're watching this morning, I love you guys. And I had the privilege of singing along with them. David and Muriel could sing like angels. And Muriel would play the piano. David would sing. And every year, we, we would just be so blessed as a church when David and Muriel would sing for us. For a time, my sister Karen got to sing along with David and Muriel. And then when she graduated from high school and went to college, uh, I got to step in. And I actually got to sing with David and Muriel as well. It was an incredible privilege. And every Christmas, we would dig out an old Dallas home song that to this day still moves my heart when I think about Christmas. The lyric said, God, it must have broke your heart to send your son away, knowing all the time the final price he'd have to pay. Left his home in glory and became a common man, and because he did, I am what I am. Now I am a man and have had two babies of my own. I wonder, could I send my babies off and all alone to help someone somewhere, somehow, to set a captive free? Could I do the same for him who did the same for me? If I was to be honest, I don't know if I could. If it came down to a choice between you and Braden, McKenna, Olivia, or Alex... You lose because I love my children that much. And that's what melts my heart and my mind during this Christmas season. Because when God the Father had a choice between Jesus and Russell and Jesus and Rick and Jesus and Ron, God chose Ron and Russell and Rick. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him. You know, Christmas is all about belief. Christmas is all about faith. And this is what God invites us into. Do you have the faith to believe that God sent his son into an obscure moment in history, into an obscure town in the middle of the Middle East, through obscure people who were crazy enough to say yes to an amazing, crazy plan? We talked about them last week. Mary, Joseph, Zechariah, Elizabeth, the shepherds and the wise men. They all took a step of faith. They all said yes to God. They embraced his plan and they had the most remarkable outcome. Love, joy, peace, and hope. Jesus called them then and he's calling us now. 
And that's the reality for all who believe. Jesus is calling. And if you believe, the Bible tells us what happens. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. It's simple and it's clear. And just so we're clear around here, these two words that I'm about to say next, they're not a bumper sticker, they're not a pat answer, they're not a band-aid on the bullet hole of someone's soul who's hurting and grieving today. We say them because they're actually true. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. The angel that appeared to Joseph and Mary laid out a plan. And the plan was this, the baby that you're about to give birth to, the baby that you're going to raise and love, he is going to save his people from their sin. But before we get to the salvation part, can we just stop with Joseph and Mary for just a moment? Can you imagine trying to raise the son of God? How do you do that? Some of you are parents and you're thinking about how your parenting has produced a certain kind of child and you're like I have no idea how you would raise the son of God how do you teach the God who created walking how to walk how do you teach the God who knows everything anything how do you raise a child knowing that one day you're not going to save him he's going to save you You know, I have no idea what Joseph and Mary knew or didn't know, but as a parent, I struggle to comprehend how in the world do you live up to that job description and raise God. I think the tension of raising God is captured so beautifully in a Christmas classic. Some of you have heard it. Some of you have been playing it on repeat because it's one of your favorite Christmas songs. The Christmas song is, Mary, did you know? Mary, did you know that one day your baby boy would walk on water? Mary, did you know that one day your son would save his sons and daughters? Did did you know? I love asking that question. Did she? Well, hold that thought in your mind. Hold that question in your mind. Mary, did you know? You know, this past year as a church... You stepped up in so many incredible ways. I don't know if you can remember back because it seems like ancient history, but the month of March here at Christ the King when we got completely shut down was, um, it was missions month. And suddenly we were all watching from home and we were still bringing missions projects to you. One of the projects was to build a, was to build a home at the Garden of Eden children's home just outside of Nairobi, Kenya. The kids who live at the Garden of Eden Children's Home, they are filled with love and joy and hope and peace. Some people gave up on them, but, but, but this group as a church, inspired by the story of Dave and Kim Ryan, they never gave up on those group of kids. Those kids have brought so much joy to us over the years. And we built a home because we believed that the spiritual mother and father of the Garden of Eden Children's Home who look after these amazing kids, we we thought that it was just simply wrong that when mom and dad went to visit their children that they would be sleeping in a storage closet. We just thought that's not cool. They need a place to call home at the Garden of Eden Children's Home. Someday I want to be in the front row when Thomas and Beatrice Amolo get home to heaven because I'll tell you what, the parade celebrating their home going is going to be something to behold because they are heroes of the faith. I've had the privilege of being with the kids at the Garden of Eden on on more than one occasion. And in the evenings, this is what they do. They host dance parties. They turn on music and they all gather together on the front patio of their house and they dance for hours and hours and hours. And I have done my best to try and dance with them. And it did not go well for me at all. In fact, I remember one, one little boy doubling over in laughter watching me and then he said... English is his very much second language, but he said, you have rhythm here and nowhere else. That is a true statement. It's a true statement. But they dance and they sing and they enter into joy. And it is so infectious when you are with them. You can't help but experience joy because they wrap you up in the purest form of love. And it is just something beautiful to behold. Well, the kids of the Garden of Eden Children's Home 
our kids from the Garden of Eden Children's Home. They recorded a beautiful, beautiful Christmas gift. And today we're going to worship through their joy and their hope. And I want to thank you. They love you. Thank you for loving them back. So remember the thought that we just touched on a few minutes ago. Mary, did you know? Well, I'd like to welcome the children of the Garden of Eden Children's Home to ask that question in their very unique, beautiful, and worshipful way. Let's watch this together. the kids and the work they did. The scripture wraps up with these words, for God did not send his son into the world. We are celebrating the Christmas, the incarnation of Jesus. Jesus came. 
for the sake of love, for the sake of joy, for the sake of hope, for the sake of peace. We had no hope. We were condemned in our sin. And then God showed up. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. That's what it says next. God didn't send Jesus to convince you of how bad you are. God didn't show up at the door of your soul and stick an eviction notice and say, this building is not fit for for, for my habitation, so we're going to tear it down and start from scratch. That's not the way God works. Instead, God chose a different way. Why? Because God is grace. Grace allows you to acknowledge you're broken in your sin, but there's still hope. Grace says, I will meet you in your brokenness because only Jesus can put the pieces back together. Jesus came to open the door of grace, not to condemn the world, and this is how it wraps up, but to save the world through him. Jesus saves and God is salvation. And when I think about the Christmas story, I see God's heart all the way through it. I see his passion to pursue human beings because he just can't rest until everyone has an opportunity to meet him. I see his love that draws me and covers me. I see his generosity in his indescribable gift. I see his plan, the plan of God through Christmas. And I see it in three ways. Number one, it's purposeful. The purpose of God's Christmas plan is so that you would have a collision with his love. That you would actually come face to face with the idea of the incarnation. That Jesus came in order to save you. It's also practical. All throughout this season we've been focusing on Advent. Hope, joy, peace, and love. And what prompts a question that comes through Advent is this. Where have you experienced the hope of God in the last year? Where have you experienced the joy of God in the past year? Where have you opened your eyes to the peace of God in the past year? Where have you experienced the love of God in the past year? I know I might take you a little bit of time, but I hope and pray that every person in this room, given the opportunity, could finish this sentence. I've experienced the hope of God through this person. I've experienced the joy of God through this opportunity. I've experienced the peace of God because of the ministry of blank. I've experienced the love of God here. However you would answer those questions, we'd love to hear from you. In fact, let's summarize it this way. Where have you seen Jesus in 2020? Let me prompt your thinking. Have you seen Jesus in a moment when all of your kids were doing their homework at the kitchen table and not a single person was screaming at each other? That's the peace of God. Did you see Jesus when someone showed up at your doorstep and knocked on the door and said, I'm only here for a few minutes. I just wanted to encourage you. Did you see Jesus in the prayers of maybe your mother, your father, your uncle, your aunt, whatever that happens to be, but they, they prayed for you and actually let you know that they were praying for you? Did Jesus show up in your quiet time in a different way than you have ever experienced before? Where have you seen Jesus in 2020? Well, I'd actually like to hear your answer. And let me tell you Why? We'd like to compile some of these answers and use them as part of our Christmas Eve service. Where have you seen Jesus in 2020? Let me put it this way. God gives and so should you. You should give your answers because your answer might actually inspire someone else to open their heart to the presence and the peace of God. So where have you seen Jesus in 2020? I'm going to ask you to boil it down to one sentence and to send it to respond.ctk.church. We might actually quote you in our Christmas Eve services and who knows what God may end up doing with your words. Where have you seen Jesus in 2020? I can only speak for me. In 2020, I saw Jesus in the tender hands of a nurse who held up an iPad so a family could say goodbye to a loved one when they couldn't be in the room. I saw Jesus in a crayon-colored drawing that came as a gift from my friend Ezekiel Page. Ezekiel, you should be an artist, and I love your pictures. I saw Jesus in my friend Bill Grimmer, 
Bill was here at the last service. Even when he couldn't come in the door, Bill would sit in his truck in our parking lot on Saturday nights and watch church on his phone. He said, I just needed to be close to home. Bill has no idea the number of times when I would walk into the commons or pull out of the side of the building at the end of the evening looking for his truck because it meant someone was watching and praying and encouraging. I saw Jesus in the weekly consistent encouragement emails of my friend Carl, all the way from California. Carl, I'm still bitter that Boeing took you to Southern California, but my friend, you have no idea how much your Monday morning emails have meant to me. I saw Jesus in my wife's quiet times. And I could go on and on and on and on. And I know if you thought enough about it that you could go on and on and on and on. Where have you seen Jesus in 2020? Share it with your spiritual family. It's also personal. God did all of this for you. Let me read the same verses in a different way. For God so loved you that he gave his one and only son so that you could believe in him and that you would not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn you, but to save you through Jesus. God is God, God is love, God loves people, God is generous, Jesus is God, Jesus is calling, Jesus saves, Jesus came, God is grace, God is salvation. That is the story of Christmas. You know, we've had something amazing happening over the last number of weeks. In every single service, people have been giving their hearts to Jesus. I think that's beautiful. And if that's God's plan, then I think we should probably stick with the plan. So I'd like to give everyone, those who are watching and those who are in the room, if you have never, ever begun a relationship with Jesus Christ, the reason for Christmas, my hope and prayer is that right now in this moment, that instead of turning away from God, that you'll actually turn towards him. That you will grab a hold of the true meaning of John 3, 16 and 17. And that today will be the day when Jesus saves you. Would you pray with me right now? Father God, I thank you for every one of my brothers and sisters who can look back to a moment in their life when you called them and saved them. And I pray that right now their hearts would just be so filled with gratitude for what you did. God, I thank you for the beauty and the simplicity of the Christmas story. The simple fact that Jesus came on a mission. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who were lost. And God, right now I pray for all those who, who would be courageous enough to admit that they're lost. And I pray that in the sacredness of this silent moment, that they would pray a simple prayer. Jesus, I'm a sinner, but you are a savior. So God, I come to you in this moment right now. And I confess that I took the life you gave me and I did it my way. But right now, I want to confess my sin. I want to repent and turn away from it and turn towards you. So Jesus, right now, I give myself fully and completely to you. I know that asking for grace is not something I deserve. But I thank you that it's a gift that only you can give. Jesus, this Christmas, I give you the only gift that I have the rest of my life. I give it to you and ask that you would walk with me and use me to accomplish your plan for my life while I'm here on earth. Jesus, thank you for saving me. Thank you for not condemning me. And thank you for giving me the gift of salvation and eternal life. I pray this in Jesus' name.